I'm Yang Moo Kim, and this is Applied Digital Signal Processing. In this video, we explore quantization and its role in digital signal processing. In our last video, we specified the Nyquist criterion, which ensures we capture the full content of a signal by sampling at a rate more than twice the highest frequency present in the signal. But to fully digitize a signal, we must store these samples as digital values or binary numbers, usually expressed in a fixed number of bits. The process of converting our sample measurement to this fixed precision of digits or bits is called quantization. Like sampling provides resolution in the x or time axis, quantization is about resolution in the y axis. As we'll see, in some ways it's the amplitude version of sampling, but in other ways it's quite different. An analog to digital converter, or ADC, performs both operations, sampling and quantization, creating a stream of digital values that capture our signal. One way to think about binary digital representations is to limit ourselves to using whole integer values. The more bits we use, the wider the range of numbers we can represent. In binary, each bit gives us two times more possible signal values. So if we have n bits, we have two to the n possible distinct signal values. For example, the original compact disc specification stores audio signal amplitudes as 16-bit values sampled at 44,100 times per second. This is still the audio format used for much of our media today. Since sound is an oscillation of positive and negative air pressures, we can express 16 bits as positive and negative integers, with values from minus 32,768 to 32,767. So with 16 bits, we can accurately represent 2 to the 16th, or 65,536, distinct amplitude levels. When we're actually processing audio signals on modern computers, we often normalize this to a decimal value between minus 1 and 1. But for simplicity, I'll leave it here as integers for now. This provides us with some boundaries. Anything beyond our max and minimum amplitudes will be capped at those values, resulting in distortion that we call clipping. This is also the sound of the volume being too high or someone talking too loudly into a microphone. The input value goes beyond the range of our digitizer, resulting in a highly distorted sound that can't be recovered. So we'd like to avoid clipping. The solution is to lower the input, either by actually being quieter, or more often putting it through an analog gain control before digitizing. As we add more bits per sample, the number of distinct amplitude levels increases. We could use these additional bits to gain more headroom, that means to accommodate larger amplitudes, or use the bits to obtain higher resolution or greater accuracy of the amplitudes within a fixed range. Either way, we call this increasing the dynamic range, or the number of distinct amplitude values that we can record. By the way, Setting the maximum value is still done manually in professional music recording to try to make the best use of the available dynamic range. What if we use fewer than 16 bits per sample? Here we see one frame of audio, which I will quantize with fewer and fewer bits. Quantization introduces deviations from the original signal, which is shown as a percent error per sample. With fewer bits per sample, you'll see the error increase and hear it as noise. It's kind of amazing that we can still hear the music using just one bit, where the average error per sample is 50%. But as you saw and heard, the fewer the bits, the greater the proportion of noise to the original signal. Conversely, 
As we add bits, the noise power decreases. This signal to noise ratio, or SNR, provides some indication of audio quality. For the particular case of noise entirely due to quantization, we sometimes label this as SQNR. In terms of distortion due to quantization, the SQNR is the same as the dynamic range. This value reflects the resolution of our quantizer. So why are 16 bits used for CD quality audio? To answer that, we need to understand a bit more about human hearing. We know most people can perceive frequencies as low as 20 hertz and as high as 20 kilohertz, but we don't perceive all of those frequencies equally. The minimum audible threshold, that's the quietest sound we can perceive, varies quite a bit. We're very sensitive around 1 to 2 kilohertz, but much less at the limits of our frequency perception. There's also a limit to the most intense sounds we can tolerate. This is known as the threshold of pain. Yes, it's when sound is so loud that it actually hurts and may permanently damage your hearing. This also varies significantly by frequency. This difference between the quietest and loudest sounds is expressed in decibels, or more accurately, dB-SPL. So what's a decibel and what's SPL? For that, we need to dig into some signal processing history, specifically the pioneering work of Bell Laboratories. In the 1920s, the early days of telephony, we sent audio as raw electrical signals over physical wires, but the signals would degrade over distance due to resistance in the cable and interfering noise. Engineers at Bell Labs wanted to quantify the reduction in signal power over a mile of telephone cable. The amount of power loss was originally called the transmission unit, but later named a decibel, with the bell, that's one L, in honor of Alexander Graham Bell, which has two Ls. Weird. But hey, engineering is weird. The difference between two signal powers can be expressed in bells as the base 10 logarithm of their ratio. Note that this is a relative comparison. This equation doesn't make sense unless there are two quantities to compare. Thus, if P1 is 10 times the power of P0, the power ratio of 10 to 1 gives us exactly one bell. A decibel is one tenth of a bell, or 10 decibels per bell. So the comparison of two powers in decibels is 10 times log 10 of their ratio, providing a finer measurement of smaller differences between powers. Now, you've likely seen decibels defined as 20 times log 10. That's because signal power is proportional to the square of sound pressure and its amplitude. Because this is a logarithm, the exponent can be rewritten as a scaling factor, hence 20 times log 10. As I just mentioned, bells and decibels are always a comparison of two quantities. So if we have just a single signal, what can we compare it against? In the case of sound, we use the sound pressure of a 1000 Hz tone at the minimum audible threshold, which is about 20 micropascals of pressure. Comparing to this reference gives us dB sound pressure level, or SPL. Here are some representative sounds in dB SPL. You can see that human hearing has an enormous dynamic range, able to handle sound pressures that differ by a factor of 10 million. So what does this have to do with bits and quantization? Well, each additional bit doubles our amplitude range, adding about 6 decibels of dynamic range. So 16 bits gives us about 96 decibels of dynamic range. Is that good? Well, let's return to the map of human hearing. We see that human hearing has a dynamic range of over 100 decibels at our most sensitive frequencies, but far less at other frequencies. So if we overlay a box with a height of 96 decibels and a width of 22,050, the Nyquist frequency, we can see what is captured by the CD specification. Depending on our gain settings, we can move this range up and down, and we realize that it's pretty good. It doesn't encompass the entirety of human hearing, but neither do most audio recordings. It also captures some things we can't hear. So 96 decibels is pretty good. 
Let's look at the effect of quantization in the frequency domain, comparing our quantized music signal in blue and the resulting noise in red. Here we can more easily visualize the signal to noise ratio, which is also usually expressed in decibels. Showing this in dB SPL units would require knowing and calibrating against your volume setting and the specifics of your headphones or speakers. So for digital signals, we normally use dB full scale or FS. With dBFS, the reference is a sinusoid or frequency with the maximum quantized amplitude, which is set to be zero dB. So any frequency at less than maximum amplitude will have a negative value. From these examples, we can see and hear that quantization noise is spectrally flat, so it is equivalent to white noise. This is also why it's sometimes referred to as the quantization noise floor. So 16 bits is still pretty good and remains widely used for produced audio, including most of the music you probably listen to. This is mostly for compatibility with older formats and devices but having more bits provides greater flexibility when it comes to additional processing. Mixing tracks, filtering, and other effects involve multiplications and additions of signals. To preserve the full accuracy of these mathematical operations, we need additional bits. Hence, 24 bits and higher are used for professional recording and production in digital audio workstation apps like Pro Tools, Logic, and Ableton Live. Early versions of these apps did their processing using integer fixed point formats because of computation and storage constraints. Now that fast processors and terabytes of storage are commonplace, modern DAWs and the systems we use for DSP research and education, like Python and MATLAB, primarily use 64-bit floating point for signal processing. I won't dive into the details here, but floating point representations are essentially scientific notation, allowing precise mathematical operations involving numbers of vastly different scales. 64-bit floating point allows for a practically unlimited dynamic range for audio processing operations. And for final output, the produced audio can be easily quantized back to 16-bit fixed point. So why not just quantize to 32-bit or even 64-bit floating point for audio recording? Well, this requires much more complex and expensive ADCs. And for most applications, recording in 24 or 32-bit fixed point has been good enough. As I'm recording this in 2022, 32-bit floating point quantizers are just coming to market in some professional field recording devices. With properly designed hardware, this can be ideal for live recording situations where the incoming dynamic range is unpredictable. As these become more widely used, we'll likely see floating point quantizers become cheaper and perhaps as common as the fixed point digitizers we currently use. Now, are there times we can use fewer than 16 bits? Thus far, I've only described linear quantization, evenly spaced on a grid, but non-uniform quantization can be more efficient, since in sound, smaller amplitude values occur more frequently than large values. In the early days of computer audio, when memory and storage space were at a premium, two formats were developed, MuLaw and ALaw encoding. Each used 8 bits per sample, but with non-uniform spacing. You can still find some files encoded in these formats on the internet. We quickly outgrew these formats, especially as computation and storage increased. But there are other reasons to use fewer bits. For example, to reproduce the sound and music found in older video games. This style is often referred to as 8-bit music or chiptunes. In this case, however, 8-bit refers to the processor, not the audio itself. The original NES could play 7-bit audio samples. 
Video game sounds of this era use mostly synthesized waveforms, sometimes using just 4 bits or even less per sample. But modern producers will also employ this bit crusher effect, as it's called, to achieve a retro aesthetic, or simply because they like the sound that comes from overly quantized signals. So now that we've sampled and quantized our signals, they are fully digital. That means we can do all our signal processing computationally, and computation is really the key to DSP. In the next video, we'll move beyond accurately capturing signals to modifying and manipulating signals via filters. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.